actually working as fast. Oh, there it goes. Welcome so much. I'm uh, coming to you from my back porch, and we have a wonderful hemp show on today, Hemp and Beyond with Farmer Tom. And with me, of course, is Miggy to help discuss. And then we welcome Father Farmer Tom Lowerman. Thanks for coming by, man. Thanks, Lawyer Tom. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate Miggy uh, throwing the invite this way. Hey, Farmer Tom. So, like most times, we'll give an introduction to guests, and, and, and but you yeah. know, I'm a I'm a fanboy when it comes to like everybody that's on our show. Anybody who's making money at cannabis, I you know, I've a lot of love and respect for you. Can you tell people why and who you are? Oh wow, uh, it's a kind of a long deal these days. I'm just telling people to Google it. It's a lot easier that way, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Me and my wife have been at this since the 90s. We had a collective in San Diego called Shelter from the Storm. Uh, basically, we got all of the patients together in San Diego, well, 21 of us at the time. And uh, we had this collective garden where you bought a light, you paid $50 a month to help keep the lights on, and then you got to take what you want. It was kind of an honor system. That's pretty and, neat. Wow. Well, back then, you know, in San Diego, it's uh, there's more DEA agents there than anywhere else in the world. And so it's kind of you're under a magnifying glass. So uh, individually, they were busting us individually. But we figured if we got together as a group, we would have more power, which we did. And and we were a big educational force down there and educating um, the city, the city council members on cannabis and how safe it is. Well, you awesome. What it. year? What year, man? When was this? You said San Diego. This back is in, in the nineties. Yeah, my my wife started it. Was co one of the co-founders there in the nineties in like ninety seven, and cool. then like um, right you know, after the medical cannabis passed in our Prop two fifteen. Well, we all, you know, we all got everybody to vote for it, and then once it was legal, we really wanted to enact it, you know, and. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, utilize our rights. But at that time, you know, the, the, the way the sheriffs and the police looked at it was, we'll arrest you and we'll let the courts take care of it. That's so, still yeah. happening. That's still oh, happening yeah. out here. We had a show on Friday where we were talking about bus happens in New York, happens in Illinois. Yeah. Well, you think San Diego, too. From, I'm from Oceanside. And it, during that time period, you would think they'd be, be super liberal, but they're not. They've been very conservative up until recently, I think. What do you think? Yeah, one of our patients. One of our patients was Chuck, and he owned a surf shop in Oceanside back in the late '90s, and he was an instrumental part. And he was a big uh, Chuck was a really good inspiration because he had some odd disease, and literally, you know, he died during going to court, proving that yeah. he was sick enough to have the wow. substance, That's which was happening a lot to patients back then. Yeah. So, and we've come a long way. Um, you know, I've worked in, you know, uh, we got raided in 1999, our Kalef guard, garden, where I got arrested for 448 plants, along with Steve McWilliams. We went to jail uh, for the night, and uh, they, uh, we were very active in the medical marijuana um, movement down there. So we would go to the town council meetings after the arrest. We went to the town council meetings, and uh, the mayor gave us back our growing equipment, and they... They just, uh, they didn't drop the charges. They just kind of let them hang. Oh, yeah. Because in case you got another one, then you'd really be in trouble. Oh, so, man. Uh, cool. So me and my wife got together at that point, and then we moved to Williams, Oregon from San Diego, where we did uh, uh, wild crafting and for herbs up there. So it was like hellebore, St. John's wort, oh. uh, chickweed, Arnica, all these different things. We would get contracts and make money. And I worked on an organic seed farm where I was a manager. So I've been landscaping my whole life. So growing things just came secondhand. And then after doing landscape construction my whole life, I knew all about irrigation, planting plants, oh, wow. everything. And it just kind of lined up perfectly for my lifelong passion to be a farmer. Yeah, and to nice. grow the things that I to grow the things that I love, including you know vegetables and cannabis, like we do on our farm, and uh, uh, you know we've been this year we 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 grew some hemp. So I'll get back into that a little bit later. We worked, uh, we got up here, we bought our farm in Vancouver, Washington, where we've been for the last fifteen years. Uh, we worked with the state to change some laws on um, on concentrates back in the day, back when Washington legalized. 
they were afraid of BHO and all the explosions and they wanted to ban it and only put it into, you know, edibles. And we was, we, we did a, a media piece with Matt Markovich out of Copa News where we gave the good side of, of concentrates and really explained that there was many more concentrates only other than BHO. And there's a smart way to make BHO and then there's a not so smart way to make it. And, yeah. you know, Is that our, the way that ends in it blowing up? Not so yeah, scary, exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so back then we said, really what you need to do is regulate it and tax it. Yeah. And then we'll stop seeing these explosions. And that was in yeah. 2013. And we don't see them that much anymore. Every now and again, you'll see an explosion or something, but it's not as prevalent as it was back then. So, and then that led to uh, a BHO explosion in New Mexico where a kid blew himself up in a certified facility. Oh, really? and OSHA got in touch with us, and then I started working with the federal government. Um, that kind of just came on. Um, the Denver Police Department filed a complaint with OSHA saying that their officers were in danger going into these grow operations because oh, wow. there was black wow. mold and powdery mildew. So the Obama administration allocated funds to do the first workplace health and safety standard study that they did on our farm in 2015. Uh, we had the honor of educating the federal government for the first time on cannabis production and processing on our in August on our farm. Just uh, we this August? Gonna, no, yeah. it was August 2015. Okay, but then this so is pretty recent. Was, only four years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah, it's all it's all pretty recent. It's not ancient history. Um, so uh, yeah, in 2017 they released it. They had some complications to, with releasing the study due to the election year. And then on uh, April 1st of 2017, they released the study and it's kind of become the foundation for all workplace health and safety standards in the cannabis and hemp industry. When you say election year, uh, stumbling on it, it always bothers me like because cannabis sometimes is a hot issue or it's not a hot issue. It's like a, 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 an electoral issue and it shouldn't be. This is a human rights issue. What, what was it stopping the thing then? What was that thing? Well, they, they originally put it up on the, on the federal government website, the study, and they pulled it down in one day. And we got the word that some state senator saw it and a Democrat and had a heart attack and said, we got to pull this down. A heart attack. So <laughs> cannabis does kill, provided it is because you're prejudiced <laughs> against cannabis so much so that you have a heart attack when it becomes legalized. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. That, I'm just being, that was just a phrase I was using, but they got upset and pulled it down that day. It was only up for like five hours. And then it took, then they said, oh, we can't do it this year. It's a hot button issue in the summer. And then they said, oh, wait till November. Oh, we've got a new administration coming in. Let's kick the can to February where they said, oh, we've got a new Department of Health and Human Services uh, person at the top. So, you know, Man. and finally in April, April 1st, did uh, uh, April, you know, I think uh, April 1st that year, I mean, the first business day was a Monday and I think it was the third. So I think on the fourth, we received an overnight package with the full report signed and everything. And, and since it was shut down before, um, I just kind of, we waited to see what was going to happen and it stayed up and it stayed up. And then, um, NIOSH, which is uh, part of the Department of Health and Human Services, CDC, uh, Center of Disease Control Division, uh, they put up on their Facebook page that they did the study with this. And yeah, lawyer Tom, that. you need to see yeah. this report. I mean, it's a beautiful, uh, it's funny too to, to, to hear about the dangers of trimming. Uh, you know, the yeah. dangers of trimming. What are these? Uh, are they cut related? Because I could see that being a Oh shoot! I, I I wanted that. Oh yeah, definitely. oh yeah, definitely. We you know we always advocate for on the you know the hand you're holding the product with to always use a, a loose glove because those scissor tips will grab that loose tip and not your skin. Oh, so mm. here I am, here I am, always dropping knowledge. I love the educational nice. part of the whole deal. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> but like it's also talking about uh, uh, air quality and. Uh, the cleanliness of the, and also carpal tunnel, you know, things that are actually real issues that you don't think about uh, when. Oh, no, dude, they hooked us up to a, a glove called the cyber glove that tracked repetitive motion. And then from the data they collected on their farm, the CDC put out an announcement that trimming cannabis and or hemp could cause carpal tunnel. So it's uh, it, it was pretty, we're kind of proud of the work we've done. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I love continuing to educate people. And now we're, we're educating the, the um, you know, the federal government on hemp and hemp production. And that's so uh, hard. I mean, like, uh, doesn't that just, how do you deal with it? Because you're just the consummate educator and patient as you've been in this industry for over 25 years or, or, tw- or close to 25 years, at least um, the prejudice and then the ignorance how do you continue to deal with that and fight against it uh, without uh, well, losing losing your soul, you know? No, you know, actually, it's all about education. Really, once you educate these guys, these public servants, they get it. Really? You know, and, you know, they really do get it. Like arbitrary numbers, like Washington State and, and I think Colorado came up with this five nanogram while you're driving. Well, oh, Vivian McCoy yeah. on, on a town hall meeting. Uh, with some state representatives from the Department of uh, Motor Vehicles, and then um, oh, I forget the other one was addict addictive substances pe- person, and they virtually said that they they grabbed that five nanogram number out of thin air, yep. and they've done the same thing with this hemp deal. They yeah, grabbed point this point three THC out of thin air, decarboxylated, which is virtually impossible for any high CBD hemp strain to have out there. Um, You know, uh, so this week I've been working with uh, folks. I've been teaching uh, at Hemp University. We have an online school, Hemp Farming Academy. Um, And and through my education, we've been working with uh, the the people from Hemp University and working with a group called the Watson Group out of Washington, D.C. They're a lobbying group. And basically we're educating them and setting up the, a meeting with the USDA in the next few weeks to meet with them face to face to show them the struggles that these un, unrealistic numbers are are causing the the small farmer out there. It's basically another way to lock the small farmer out of uh, the big picture. Yeah, totally. You know, yeah. They get these opportunities once in a lifetime, and we've seen what happened in Washington State. It turned out to be an elitist thing, and only the biggest and the strongest and the biggest companies made it. Yeah, and all the moms and, yeah. and all the people who put their life savings in, countless people who put their life savings into this. And the ag department's kind of with me on this. I mean, it kind of just wiped the playing field where it was too costly for the small farmer to uh, compete or even get their products out there. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, and then I, does that I, Delta 9, that 0. 0.3 number, is that what you're talking about? Is that going to just be impossible for farmers to keep oh, it under? Is. Well, it's, yeah, it's THC plus Delta 9 and then decarboxylated, which really shoots the numbers up. So it's totally this arbitrary number. They pulled out of thin air. They used it in Canada. They went for the lowest common denominator, this 0.3 number, and and the United States picked it up. Uh, We think it's kind of ridiculous being in in cannabis and being an educator and then teaching at colleges, uh, cannabis and your health courses. It's kind of ridiculous to think that anything that anything under five or six percent would give anybody any kind of psychoactive offense so why are we messing around with this arbitrary pulled pie out of the sky number that really has nothing to do with what they're afraid of you know and And then criminal criminal liability on top of it i mean like you're messing with this arbitrary number and if you go over that line like there's no remediation, and then not only is there no remediation, you could expose yourself to criminal penalties. Well, I'm not just saying your yeah, product. I mean, in, in it's definitely, it's definitely. Uh, uh, if you're in this industry, you got to be like Gumby, and you know it's not not an easy uh, road to haul. Uh, right. You know, me working with the federal government. You know, they told me my phone's tapped for the rest of my life, and oh, all, oh hey, no, let's out. let's thank our guest, the federal government. <laughs> you know there's a trade-off in these things you know oh, yeah. for me to get the honor to work with them and right. to still be in contact with them you know i mean that's kind of why i've waited uh to jump in you know to launch my brand until hemp because it was federally legal and the big the main reason is is i can take the tax deductions for the build out my employees everything yeah. that's yeah. kind of this ade really wrecks the whole the whole thing for any small, small individual or small so does, farm. Like, not being able to bank this. I mean, think of a farm that doesn't have a bank loan. 
I don't know any farms that don't have a bank loan. That's just or like an operating yeah. loan or like a mortgage on their land or something that they can access the capital to do a capital intensive industry. And so you take away not just uh, the 280 E and dealing all in cash, but you know, the dealing all in the cash, that's the banking aspect and you can't finance it. it and it just puts the barriers up, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's been totally unfair to the small farmers and working with the Washington State ag department, they realize that they see that and they really wanted to make this hemp thing work for the small farmer and medium sized farmer here in Washington state. We had a guy yeah. last week or a uh, uh, couple days ago, it all kind of merges together. Um, who's has a client for, for transporting hemp. And I think he's in Illinois, right? Your partner, Tom, lawyer, Tom, which one, uh, the, the guy who's in, going through the process right now, his product is being held up in, in prison. Oh, Oh, there's a, yeah. Somebody was got, got caught transporting. And then that happens though, in every single state, people what will get pulled over with the buckets. And then they're like, no, this is clearly marijuana. But he's it a small time farmer. I mean, literally, he's literally a small time farmer. Some dude that invested 60 K or whatever investment mm -hmm. looking to get like a 200 K return, which is not, it shouldn't be uh, uh, unexpected. It, he should be as a American citizen person, uh, uh, you know, someone who wants to just do better for his family and the greater good. Mm -hmm. He's not a criminal. He's a farmer, you know, and right. he's very good integrated because he's got to transport his own shit, which is horrible. But like you got to talk about this arbitrary rule coming up. Uh, with the arbitrary numbers farmer tom what are you doing right now for like what can the people do to help you to to, to get the message out to these guys to change this rule well there's a change.org uh, petition we've been hanging around and then uh there's the the watson group out of dc um if you really want to get involved uh, i would look these guys up they're real they've done a lot of great work already in changing laws and you know, they can open up the door so we can go visit the USDA and and the FDA and kind of educate them again on what's really going on and what real numbers look like and how you're going to be fair to the struggling Americans across this country. You know, how do you I mean, give them such a, a line, though? Such a, such a separation yeah. of wealth, you know, that's true. That it, it, the entry point to any new industry, you have to pretty much sell your soul to get into it. So that's what, you mm -hmm. know, my wife refused to, we don't, we haven't taken any money. Uh, we've done all this by ourselves. We're all self-funded through, you know, you know, basically through education and doing what I do. And, um, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to be able to roll out our brand, you know, as you know, soul, you know, we, we haven't taken any money and we're not going to take any money. It's just, it gets too complicated. And then at some point it comes from me and my family to we and some investor who wants right. to quit. He wants to exit. He wants to pay back. He wants but he wants to back. return, you know, and then it's, it's not, interest. it's unreasonable. It is unreasonable. Yeah. yeah. And then they, they can be overconfident too. It's just, if you look uh, at the, if you look at the restaurant industry, they don't even start making and, and all their money starts in five years. I think that's a good number. This this twenty four to thirty six month we want to see a return oh. is 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 ridiculous and it's put so many people under and I think uh, the investors need to need to have a longer vision instead of this you know short short capital we're going to make money real quick uh, mm -hmm. type mentality it's really you know not fair to the small farmers and the uh, people who are opening up the stores and the processing right. facilities. How, when you're working with the USDA, how do you give them like a metric? Because that's the thing that these guys, these bureaucrats, they always want. They want something to measure. So how do you give them a measurement between marijuana? And by that, I mean, THC cannabis mm -hmm. and hemp. And by that, I mean, uh, well, hemp, there's some, there's some actual, yeah, there's yeah. some actual studies going on out there. And some people of our group are, are, are brilliant, brilliant people who have studied cannabis for a long time and THC and CBD and all the ratios and we're you know our main thing is to give them really good science because that's what they want and they i think the science the science is 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 out there it's starting to trickle in hmm. um because it's been you know pretty much federally illegal to do any studies on it and that's that's, right. that's been their whole mode of apparatus you know let's kick the can down the road since the 60s are going oh we don't have any research let's yeah. kick the can <laughs> down the road. But, well, but we've made research illegal, right? Yeah. You know, and then in the '70s, same thing. Cannabis comes up again. 
boom, kick it down the road. We don't have research. So it's kind of this thing. We need thing, more but, research. Do the research. Well, the, we can't we do the research. research. But thank God for the internet, and we're able yeah. to talk uh, openly and get real truth across, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the regular mainstream media was jumping for joy, you know, that this new farm bill was the greatest thing that ever happened. But really what it does is it makes no, you'll have no CBD on the market next year, none whatsoever. Yeah. You know, it, it, the, only, yeah. the only thing you'll be able to pretty much grow out there, if you grow a CBD crop, you're going to have to harvest it, you know, at like week three, you know, I mean, where there's, about, I don't, that's like flower sour sour apples, you know, like when the apple isn't even close to being ripe and thinking you're going to get juice out of it. What? Yeah. Yeah. The, no smokable flour, and then the price of extracts going to go up because the yields are going to go into the toilet. I don't, you know, it's ridiculous. ridiculous. PBG is you know? the workaround. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. The big workaround, and it's the precursor to THC and CBD and uh, a lot of the other cannabinoids. So from that, they can extract it. The Crawford brothers and a bunch of people are working on uh, some CBG seeds out there. We've got a hold of some here on our farm, and. Uh, yeah, we're, you know, that's what we're going to look for next year. But until then, you know, we, we're really encouraging people to get out there and call your state representatives, call the call, uh, you know, make the calls, call the USDA, fill out their online survey. Uh, they've got a, a, a survey out there to ask about the full USDA report and to give your comments. And I think that's key. Everybody needs to yeah. do that but before yeah. you do it. Make sure you do your homework. You know, there's like three big issues with this. And first is the 0.3 decarboxylated THC with no strains out there that are high in CBD will ever get to hit. So all that stuff illegal right off the bat. The second thing is where they're taken from samples. Generally, the way they do samples now, they take one top bud, a medium, a medium size branch and a large branch at the bottom. They combine all of that together to get their result, like our Washington State results for total TH for T total. I think it was total THC was 0.17. So yeah. we're good for commerce. We've got our letter back from the state saying we're good, and Washington yeah. hasn't made their rules yet. So we really got to keep an eye out on Washington and make sure they make the right decisions. The first, where we're really focusing on is this federal deal and the yeah. USDA. And grabbing the right group of people up there that they'll they'll listen to, and uh, there's there's definitely um, you know these Watson Group guys have done some amazing things, nice. and uh, I look forward to uh, contributing any way I can. Do you, do you think also too we're asking the wrong question? Could it be also like uh, the the science is here? Like we already know everything about this plant that we really need to know. Can we just say what we need to do is establish when it's a fun time? Right back. And when it's fun time, cannabis, you know, like, like marijuana light and marijuana, you know, great. Maybe that's a question that we should be asking, you know, because like marijuana light, let's say, okay, 5% THC, which like you were saying before, like, it's hard to get that 1%. But is 5% really such a high number to be asking for? No, THC I'm not 5%. Tested? I'm like 3% better because you start Three. feeling, yeah, because you start feeling the psychoactive. I got to be, you got to play in a in a I'll be honest a, that's how it goes realm, right realm where they can get around the idea too. Yeah. Right. Now you can't start going, okay, we're gonna put it at eight percent. You know what I mean? Pushing the envelope. We you know the whole thing with hemp and the hemp movement is really not get about getting people high. Right. You know right. It, it's an alternative to cannabis where you can get some of the benefits through the terpene profiles and the other cannabinoids to get what to get what you're looking for you're not going to get the same psychoactive effect and you know a lot of people re out there really aren't looking for that you know right. a, a couple yeah. of some nice uh high cbd flour like our um sour space candy or our bubba nice. kush is really relaxing really tasty and you know we grew hemp this year like we grew high grade cannabis we didn't know if this is our first only chance we might as well go for the gusto I yeah. worked on a farm down in Southern Oregon and Williams in the Applegate Valley where we were growing, um, you know, 30,000 plants down there. And, wow. and how did you do Bubba Kush as a high CBD strain? Well, well, they're, it's breeding. It's all, it, it's all in breeding. They, br they bred it way down. So it's super low numbers, almost non-detect in this variety. It comes from wow. Humboldt seeds. I think these, these, uh, the ones that I got and, uh, 
they they turned out pretty good. I mean, we had the worst weather in, in the Pacific Northwest or on the West Coast or across the country for agriculture in the last right. 71 years, you know? So yeah. uh, it was really a struggle, you know? I mean, when on my course and when I'm talking, I'm always about giving people usable information that they could really use um, instead of trying to sell them something. And, you know, my big thing this year is everybody's stuff got greedy and put their plants too close together. Wow. There was no breeze or air could circulate between the plants. Thus, all the rotten mold. Oh. And then, you know, there's a lot of things about this year. You know, when I, when that's, I, that's, talk, a, that's I, an actual tip. Well, there was a hailstorm too that you had to survive through. Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. the, the Eastern, Eastern Oregon had a hailstorm. We had relentless rain all through January, um, you know, and uh, it, it just wasn't a, you know, it rained all through July. It was just like a really weak summer we haven't seen in a, in a, in a really long time. So, um, you know, I think when you plant your plants, you know, make a row. We like to go, we like to go 10 feet between plants and make a vineyard. between plants? Yeah, well, 10 feet between the plants. So you have a row to drive up and down and take right. your tractor and keep the, the weeds suppressed and the oh. grasses suppressed and, and be able – and plus, on years like this year, you know, we plan for it anyways. We're west of the Cascades in Vancouver, Portland area where it's not really the best climate to grow much of anything out here because we have traditionally short summers and then we get a lot of moisture, which, which enhances the mold, you know, powdery mildews and, you know, botrytis and these type of things. So we kind of plan for it anyways, just because of where we're situated. But I tell everybody, you know, make sure you got enough room to get up and down those rows, you know, foliar feeding is a great, a great thing to do. And you can see really good, you know, your plants really love it and, and excel from it. So, but everybody got greedy this year. They get on their phone calculators and they start running these numbers. And all of a sudden, oh yeah. All of a sudden they're buying villas in France. You know what I mean? And uh, before the crop is planted, I would like oh, to, the, Oh, traditional, tra you know, it's hilarious. You know, yeah. and for me, we just got all of our crop in. We're finished drying it right now and then bucking it right now. And it won't be until that point that we go, okay, this is what we got. We're looking into different product ideas, things that me and my wife and our daughter, we've been using for years around our farm and our house and how to incorporate those, you know, into products. So, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on in, in the hemp world right now. You know, I'd like to say, I know farmer Tom from the, the medical market scene, like, uh, Tom lawyer, Tom is amazed when I talk about how we had farmers right. markets and all the other shit that went on when it was medical and, uh, you know, uh, farmer Tom would pop out in and out of different markets throughout. He had his own brand, you know, I mean, look at the man by himself. He's just, but to top it off, he had the quality cannabis. Like it's no shit. He he's there. He's, He's the reason why you should take his advice when he talks about making. Right. But then again, he's on that scale, right? And this is why the hemp uh, bill can help so many small people like me. I just have a small house that I'm renting with a little yard. If I had that chance when it was medical back then, I didn't want to grow. I had no interest in growing back then because I got quality cannabis cheap because everybody and their mother and father were growing cannabis in their house and selling it to the pot shops locally. So there was quality was the competition. That was, I mean, people look at the pound and they're like, you know, you could turn it over if you had quality cannabis, make money and, and tax free and, and then go on and, and, and reinvest that yourself or get bigger. You know, and back when Farmer Tom, when it was medical, he did all the right things like with the herbals. He was doing all the you understood both the, the regular market that you're contracting for with, with, with like all the echinacea and all that stuff. But you also understood quality cannabis and like just a little bit got you big way back then it gave everybody a small timer a chance you know as a citizen right now we're, we're going to hand over the shit to big brother or whoever big ag uh, this is bullshit i don't i don't think so man i i you know from from the beginning i've i've always had this long game in 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 focus you know what i mean where the finish line is and my main thing was to uh to do something you know make it so i can I would be in the industry for a long time and the work with the federal government kind of put me in that place. There's only one first out there and we just happen to be it. So I feel really blessed that I I've been given that. And uh, when you say and, first though, like, what does that mean? First, we so were you were working the first, we were the first private company to work with any federal agency on cannabis production and processing. For we, say were anything, like we were the first to educate any federal agency 
on production of processing and cannabis. Before, at that time, they all everybody thought, just like when we did the BHO video with uh, uh, Matt Markovich, that we were all going to jail. Same thing yeah. was going to happen. <laughs> that I was going to bring him in. The DEA was going to follow him through the gate. And Farmer Tom was going to be off to the who's gal. And I just didn't Man. believe it. And I had been on the phone with these guys several different times. And it just didn't feel that way. And sometimes you got to risk the risk reward deal. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I really don't know of anybody else who would have invited the feds into their backyard, showed them your 80 or 90 plants, walked them through them, showed you how you grew them, showed you how to process them and, and, you know, just let them, you know, you've been part of the process of normalization. I think in my opinion, that interaction that you've had, that you did with that report, you know, I mean, the CDC was part of this shit, you know, I mean, it's pretty awesome that you yeah. did. Another farmer, Tom fun fact is he has a strain of named after him in Spain, I believe. Right. Yeah, the, the yeah, that was a cut that we had, and they and they had for a while over there in Barcelona, um, and uh, yeah, the guys at Granados, I got to tip my hat. I always give the guys at Granados a shout out. Those guys are pretty amazing. I think I'm going to be going back to Spanibus uh, this year, hopefully. When is Spanibus? Uh, Spanibus is in March, and it runs in Barcelona, and it's a great time where the whole world gets together and celebrates cannabis for a week. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty. It show you know it, it makes our shows here in america even the mj biz shows look you know pretty weak you know because <laughs> yeah. in, in europe they've been they've done the seed thing forever and you know sensi seeds and uh barney's farms and all these guys that have been around forever these guys make bank you know there's a lot of money in seeds you know one plant you can get thousands yeah. of seeds and if you're selling them for you know 10 for a hundred bucks and that's you ain't got to water it. it keeps for a bit on yeah the yeah and then if you're still, so they have the money to build these unbelievable booths like these booths have bars in them Fuck. the sensi seed one was three three stories tall you know i think they must have had a, a half a million dollars easily or higher in their booth all hey, right Mickey, we gotta we gotta get like more popular so we can get on a flight and, and, and Dude, do an episode and, Cannabis. I, the, the European scene, I think, has been freaking well. Obviously, Amsterdam. You know, high times. They've been part of that. But but after Amsterdam, name name another one. Because like I knew because like, Barcelona was big even like back in like oh three yeah. when I was there. And so like after Amsterdam, and Barcelona, I'm out of cities. You know, where else is yeah. it big in Europe? Well, I guess you know Portugal's pretty big. They've kind of de uh, decriminalized all narcotics yeah. down uh -huh. there. Yeah, yeah, Spain yeah. in general, Spain in general is loosening it, loosening up a little bit. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure what else is moving around out, out there. I know the Slovakian countries um, kind of have a, a pretty good uh, um, if, uh, cannabis movement there. Yeah. If I'm talking, do you think um, what's do you know the regulation like in Spain? Do you think we are overregulating Americans right now and doing ourselves a disservice where like we don't have those seed banks? We don't have that because we had that. We would have more money here and more farmer power, I guess, would be the word to say. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, we just haven't, you know, uh, the Netherlands really had the were able to develop all the seeds and. And basically, that's where they came from. Then they, they uh, a lot of seed development went into uh, uh, Spain. And uh, so, you know, as far as seed development here in the country, oh, don't, don't, don't kid yourself. In the, in the hemp world, the Crawford brothers are making millions, tens mm. of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars selling their seeds. Mm. And between a dollar and two dollars of seeds, Oh, okay. Those guys yeah. are making enormous amounts of money. So are all their um, seeds now kind of like screwed with a uh, 0.3 total. Yeah, yeah, but they've been developing two different varieties of CBGs, and they've kind of been Perfect. waiting for this to happen as kind of their backup plan. But the CBGs they don't have any terpenes, and they kept oh. the terpenes out, out oh, of wow. it for a reason because it was clogging up the cultivators that were getting into fields harvesting on large scales. Huh. So the turf is where all the resins are and the, all the stickiness right. and this was clogging up their equipment. Wow. So they developed DBG varieties with no terpene profiles. Hmm. 
But I thought that was some of the good stuff, like those terpene profiles. I thought there was like benefits to them. Stuff. Well, it, they are, but all they're really looking for is the CBG because it's the precursor to a lot of different other cannabinoids like uh, CBD and THC. Are there any uh, big players trying to influence the uh, the upcoming regulation that you heard of? Like, is anybody helping you? You know, like the well, the, you know, I mean, they have already the big players already. The hemp roundtables already mm. uh, through it big influence and that, that was a pay to play group i couldn't join it because i farmer tom didn't have the twenty five thousand dollars to become a member you know yeah. um so uh, there's a lot of these uh, elitist uh groups out there who think they're gonna be able to control the market through their through the money but the american farmer has been dragged through the you know just yeah, really again over yeah. the years and this year especially with soybeans and corn and all this stuff going south, I'm getting, I get calls weekly from large agricultural farmers in the Midwest and across the country who want to know more about growing hemp and are ready to, ready to make the move. Wow. Do you think if everybody just grew hemp and then uh, at this one point, that's when uh, soybean values go back up, you know, cause I mean, there's always a supply and demand thing, man. Something's going to take push and pull here. Yeah. I mean, but you know, hemp is so versatile, you know, there's, yeah. You know, there's 2,000 different industrial, you know, uses. components. But I've heard uses. the problem is that we don't have the uh, capacity yet for the refining of the industry for hemp in the United States. Like the only thing we really have is extraction for taking the oils out. And we really don't even have that well developed either. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely out there. And there's a lot of processing facilities around a lot of farmers who made good money in the last few years or started their own processing facilities to handle their own, you know, their own. Mm -hmm. So I think a, the, a lot of the business, you know, is being taken over by, uh, by the, you know, like what I like to say is uh, if you're going to get into the hemp game, there's, there's a couple of things. First of all, when you get into the hemp game, number one thing is to have your drying and your storage nailed down before you buy your first seed. Because the big bottleneck we're seeing in the hemp industry right now is, is we can't get these crops out of the ground and dried and ready for a processing facility. Mm. So it's really, not, it's really not the processing facilities that are making the oils that are, are super backed up. It's the lack of places to dry and you know and store your thing because dry end cannabis takes up a huge amount of space you would you would never believe yep. we did 700 plants on my farm and i and i've got 100 foot greenhouses with about 400 feet of uh so i have 1600 uh feet of hanging space on uh, on coated coated wire through my greenhouses and we we packed 700 plants in there Damn. So wow. you really got to figure if you've got a, uh, let's say a 25,000 square foot building, you know, I think an acre, I think an acre of hemp is going to take up about, uh, let's see, 3,000 square feet of, of drying storage space. And that's being like 16 to 36 feet high, which you can make these drying walls. Uh, there's a lot of other drying methods out there, like the vent coes. They use them for the hop world. But what I see, it really de degrades the pot, and it's a misservice to the plant because you're burning through these dry radiant heaters that are on top of uh, shipping containers. They cut the roofs off, yeah. and they put the heatings inside, and then they got these carts with screen bottoms, and they put it on top, and they heat dry this stuff. Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask really you about that. So it kills all you, the trichomes and it really kills your CBDs, all of your cannabinoids, brings the levels down. And then you lose a lot coming out the bottom, you know, like they're using them in the CB for CBG. But if you know, if you got up in touch with CBG, once it's dry and you take that bud in the air and you tap it, you can see a cloud of CBG uh, just off. So those uh, trichomes are not secured on there with the usually the terpenes oh, okay hold those trichomes in place with no terpenes these and it's just going to get worse so you really you're going to lose all your cbg if you're trying to dry them in these type of facilities hmm. um you know the, the hang method the hippie hang dry 
it seems like the best way to go. You preserve all your terpenes, you preserve all your cannabinoids. Have you been have you been growing the CBGs? Yeah, we got a hold of a couple of them this year for testing. And uh, are they curing? Yeah, okay. they, they look. Oh, uh, yeah, I have a few jars right here. <laughs> Yeah, well, like when you shake it, then like just because of that, uh, uh, you know, uh, here's a, you just gave us, it, it sounds like, you know, it'd be good for making keef. Like if, does all the CBG just yeah. fall right off or is it stuck to the, to the buds? Yeah. Let me good? see if I can pull out a, let me see if I can pull out a bud and give you a little demo. Of what all right. Let's, let's go to the full screen then. All right. Looking so like here's a pretty... the bud. Let's see if yep. I can get it to focus. Yeah. I want to sniff this. I can out. see a little on my side, but basically, when you do that, uh, you can see the trichomes yeah. just falling off. Yeah. In there. Uh, so, when you're trying to dry these things quickly and and do it in mass production, I think you're leaving a lot of in the CBG world. I think you're leaving most of your product left in the on the floor. So far, wow, Tom, I didn't know that that flower that you grow, right, that CBD flower. You know, and I, I don't think a lot of people we 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 uh, we misnomer the whole hemp thing as far as People are saying you should grow hemp or people grow getting the hemp for one, uh, use it as extract for like creams and whatnot or, 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 or for uh, industrial material use. But that flower, I mean, you can just as easy put it pack it in a bowl and smoke it too, right? Like I could smoke that just like I do my regular flower right now. Right. I mean, oh, yeah. And, and so <laughs> stuff is really amazing. I mean, it trim. This is CBG right here. It trims and looks like cannabis. It has a slight terpene profile, uh, but but the medical effects are pretty big. You know, my uh, my neighbor yeah. who's uh, been, had sleeping insomnia problems and back issues for a long time. Um, I got a sample of some CBG isolate and I and I gave it to him, and man, his whole world switched around. Man, so uh, so you know, I grew two of these, and you know, I gave one to him so he could you know take care of it. Because like you were saying before, how like flower and branding and personal as a vertical is the way for farmers, small farmers, you know, I think it's also a way for just any American, for every American that has a chance to be a farmer. If you could grow even like a small one plant and get what a pound out of it, you could probably turn it over. Still, it's not like street value freaking, um, you know, but we're at no, I think yeah. I'm a I'm a full home grow home grow guy. I think everybody should be able to grow six plants minimum. Yeah, and to like take it. care of, to take care of their family. Um, yeah, uh, you know, there's there's so many. You know, the money is such an aspect in making the money at these rec grows that they really don't cure the pro bud properly. And uh, from here is a lot of uh, they don't really take care of them. You know, there's there's questionable you know, insecticides and herbicides they spray on them and, and that have effects. And yeah, well, like, you know, the, curing, the curing that you're saying, I mean, it all has a, a step in it that if you had a chance to home grow, then you have a chance to learn that and know that opposed to just like, I don't know why this hurts my lungs this today, or I don't know why, because then you get a taste too, you know, like you can tell like someone didn't purge something. I don't know. Uh, well, yeah. But I, I just all, think it's quick to market. It's all quick to market and yeah. efficiency these people they take it as a business and they really don't care about the consumer the only thing they care about the consumer is they come back and buy more right but, well then you know, you'd figure they would care I, more about the cannabis you know you would think so because yeah. that's what that's what's going to bring back the customers right. you know I, I judge a lot of competitions and my biggest complaint is is it looks good it smells good and it tastes doesn't taste very good at all oh okay well then let's get to the real question though what makes for the tastiest cannabis with your growth experience i would like to hear how do you, make big, some, how do you grow some I'm tasty big, cannabis? i'm a big mineral guy we've been using minerals in our vegetables and our cannabis here for years it really brings out the the, the missing link in most soil is this, is minerals a broad spectrum of minerals and hmm. You know, we, we use it through glacial rock dust, and we use a product that comes out of Mexico. It comes from uh, a byproduct of the salt industry. It takes okay. all the min separates the salt from all the minerals, and oh. then all the stuff that came out of the ocean. And that's turned out to be just an amazing component for minerals and uh, a microbial growth and enhancer. And I'm a, I'm a big microbe guy, and I'm all about living soils and you know, the better you take care of your soil, the better plant it's going to, you know, the better the plant's going to taste, 
and the yeah. the better healing's gonna get. What happens is people use too many synthetics, like Miracle Grow and Eagle Twenty, and yeah. everybody wonders why they feel nervous and agitated and twitchy. Well, it's because your the product you bought wasn't grown, you know, organically or sustainably, you know, and they they cut corners so they can make it easier on themselves when they all they really care is about the money and they really don't care about the the end consumer. Is is your farm recognized as organic? Uh, yeah, the federal government said I have had yeah. an organic farm. You know, we're not an, a, a, a USDA certified organic farm, but when sure. the fed in the study it says I'm an organic farm and that I grow organic cannabis. So uh, I guess in that in in that sense, uh, I'm an organic farmer. They tested all my soils, they saw all my nutrient inputs, they did everything here. So. Um, it, it looks like I, 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 I'm an organic farmer. So <laughs> <laughs> I can testify that it's quality. That's that's for sure. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to taste it. Uh, but you know, that's really awesome. Uh, what else would you recommend that people that uh, are really excited about hemp do if they wanted to get into the industry and start farming it themselves? Well, do your homework, you know, and make make sure you buy seeds from a reputable. Uh, operation. Generally, I tell everybody you want to see at least three C of A's, certificate of analysis that will give you the basic data on the seeds and the genetics, the germination rate, the, if they're feminized, the feminization rate. You want to see these documents. And then the, the key thing is to be able to talk to a couple of farmers that have actually grown these genetics mm. and make sure they're going to be the genetics that you want. That's the key component. Because uh, last year there was a lot of charlatans out there. Um, Chuck and pollen, as we like to say, and just uh, you know, creating a mess. You know, once you once you when when you just start chucking pollen on that stuff, and really don't do the due diligence in the breeding techniques by you know uh, culling out the bad the bad ones or the the traits that you're not looking for, and then rebreeding them again several times to get stable genetics. What happens is you get you just do these, these pollen checkers do a one and done, and then they pump all these seeds out there. And then there's hermaphrodites and males and all kinds of issues. And, you know, I know seeds are expensive, but really do your homework. And science. What size do you think someone should start? Like as a small time, just want to get Like I want to quick tech, man. Like I'm done. I want to be live off the grid and, and, and just have a farm. Like what do I need? An acre, two acres, 10 acres? Man, we, you know, we had our, I was working on a couple of farms this year, but we had our hands, we had our hands full with three, you know, two to three people at our, you know, just a half acre that we did. Here. Oh man, that's so, awesome. So, so what I just say is like work backwards, you know, I knew I had these, these greenhouses that had the capability of using drying. Hmm. Uh, we tried to use propane. It was too costly. It was going to cost us over a hundred dollars a day in propane. Oh, wow. So our, our backup plan was just to turn the greenhouse into a big wind tunnel, which we Ooh, did. Damn. Have all these commercial fans, and if you keep the product moving, even in damp weather, you can keep the product from molding. Yeah, air movement, just the same in growing. And uh, mm -hmm. through the wind tunnel method, we survived like ten days of rain, and then we went into this last uh, ten days here, where we've had nicer weather and drier weather. We were able to, uh, you know. Um, start drying in the greenhouse and then bring them into a drier area and finish them off. Nice. So pretty sweet. So man. yeah, yeah, it's been a, uh, it's been a challenging year. If you really want to, you know, if you, if you're a, a large scale farmer, um, start a five, but I've, like mm -hmm. I said, work backwards. Where are you going to dry it? First of all, okay. make sure you have the drying space, make sure the structure is going to be able to hold all that weight. Mm. Make sure, you know, if you can, to have a customer before you, you buy a seed. And then once you have those variables down, your storing space and stuff, keep working backwards. Okay, now I know that I can comfortably grow three acres. All right, we, we, let's buy the seeds for three acres. And then don't get greedy and put in your plants too close together. Keep them nice and spread apart for bad years who knows you know if we're if we're into a trend of bad uh agricultural summers but these things we we need to adjust for so I do your homework in your 10 foot space how big do those root balls get they get pretty they get pretty big you know we fluff up our rows and um you know we use a black mulch and uh really keeps the uh 
the roots, the, the soil around your roots. The key of, for soil is you want it to be as light as fluffy as possible so uh -oh. those roots can travel easily through the soil. So you don't want, you don't, never want people walking in your beds or walking up and down your rows or just like in agriculture, we make everybody go to the end of the row and come back instead of jumping over rows. What happens is people do that and then they start stomping on the rows and then all of a sudden, you know, this nice fluffy airy soil is also all of a sudden compact down and um, it really stunts, can stunt the growth of the plant. So Damn. It's wow. pretty good with that. But the roots are so yeah. essential to like the height and everything of the plant. I mean, you're, it's always yeah. about the roots, right? I mean, yeah, it's always about the roots. I mean, um, seeds work better than clones for that reason. You know, uh, the, the clones shoot out lateral because when you're making, uh, you're making your clone. Uh, you know, you've cut off the tap root, and and this, you're just going to get lateral roots. Where the seed has a tap root and it drives really deep down into the dirt and. As loose as you can keep that soil, that taproot will continue to go down. Mm, I, had the, yeah. I had this group uh, let me test demo. Um, a thing was called uh, an aqua spy. It's by um, Farm QA. And basically, it's a probe we put in the ground. It's 48 inches. We drilled a hole. And then we put this probe in the ground. And it hooks up to a uh, solar-driven satellite connection that collects the data now the probe is uh 48 inches but every four inches there's a sensor in there for uh heat moisture and uh ec electric current and basically the electric current keeps track of where your uh fertilizer is huh and uh so you can actually see when you water how deep it goes did it get to the end of your roots when you watered did you water too much and then push the Oh, the wow. nutrient fertilizer past the roots. So really, we all know what's going on up, up by looking at it. Yeah. This, this nice tool from Farm QA just uh, makes it so you can see down in the dirt and, and really get a good perspective of what's going on. And you're collecting key data, mm. you know. Um, and, and as we all know, uh, data is everything. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we're testing the product right out of the fields and collecting that data and then collecting the data of the soil with the temperature and the moisture rate and what, what, where the roots were and where your fertilizer was during the whole process, we could really learn a lot and save a lot of money on uh, agriculture, yeah. in, agriculture in the future in general. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a techie guy at heart, and uh, but I'm still – Pretty old school in a, in a lot of different ways. Well, it's so funny how you said uh, you, you, it's telling you what you can tell from the top by looking at it, right? Like that's your old schoolness as far as like I had an issue with uh, it was getting dark green in the center. And I took a picture of it and everybody, every farmer's like, oh, it looks like you need nitrogen or you have too much. And I'm like, okay, okay, yeah. I get, my soil does whatever. Um, but I was just more concerned, is this a bad thing or a good thing, you know? Uh, and everybody's like, oh, it's new growth. But like if I were to have a probe, and then a program where, like, somebody with your experience, because that's what's going to happen. It's going to go, all that information is going to come to an app, and it's going to say, worry or don't worry. I mean, it's all. Well, is the app going to smoke it for me, too? I mean, come on. <laughs> but if I want Farmer Tom quality freaking herb, Tom can just put out his information in that program, and then that's what you got to monitor and keep consistent within that 90 days of growth, you know, or whatever time frame you do it in. You know, I mean, you have a gold mine on top of your experience, but you're the data, like you said, it's all, it's all need. It's all want. Yeah, yeah. So my goal is to get out a bunch of, uh, uh, these probes out across the country. Um, mm. the first week in February, I'm going to be in New Mexico. Um, I'm cool. keynote speaking their first hemp event down there. We're going to, we're going to do a full day of, uh, of just nuts and bolts of growing hemp, the do's and don'ts, nice. all that kind of stuff. So if you're in New Mexico, Come on out to see us down there. We're going to be in uh, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm pretty stoked to be there. I've never been there before. So uh, this Fuck this uh, journey is kind of taking me all around the world, and uh, I'm pretty blessed and thankful to be able to do it. Oh, awesome, man. man. Yeah. I and mean, we're really thankful for you coming on and like dropping all these knowledge bombs all over us about the, uh, the hemp industry and where it's going next year. I really appreciate it, man. Oh, no worries. Anytime you guys need any information or updates, feel free to reach out. I'd be more than happy to walk you through what I know and what I see coming down the road.
Cool. Where can people find uh, more about you? Uh, you can go to Farmer Tom Organics. You can Google Farmer Tom. Uh, if you're interested in this, the school, hempfarmingacademy.com. You can find me on uh, Facebook, Farmer Tom Lowerman. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Farmer Tom Lowerman. We're on Twitter. Uh, we kind of we're kind of out there. We've got a really popular YouTube channel right oh, yeah, now for Farmer Farmer Tom's Hemp Company, and we Farmer really Tom talk Hemp about Hemp. the school Hemp Farming Academy. And uh, we've got some great videos out there, dropping some knowledge. And uh, um, you know, yeah, it's been a it's been a great journey. I I really love educating and you know and being able to uh, you know help people make correct decisions. You know. When yeah. I get out there and talk, I'm, I'm kind of like raising the bar because I give people real data in the group yeah. and the circle that I talk in. What I've noticed over the last year is they're all starting to give real data and not so much, well, come to my table and you could buy my services. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm all about dropping real knowledge and giving people real information like I did here today about the seeds and you know other things you need to worry about. Uh, you know, Air consideration. circulation. Air, Air circulation. Yeah. Right all that stuff. So you know, I like to give people good, good information. And, and I, you know, if, if everybody succeeds, then I succeed. So right. that's nice. what's going to happen. Awesome. It, Tom. All right. Thanks, Biggie, for uh, dropping by and sharing an hour of your time on this Sunday. And I'll see you Wednesday. I think we have a pretty cool guest. He was one of those, one of the new POWs of the, uh, the hemp war. Somebody was arrested over in New York. I think we're going to have him on the show. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Green Angel CBD. Yeah, that was a... Green Angel CBD. Yeah, yep. yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. All right.